Shalom all. Ariel Bart Sadok here from the Kosher Torah School. You find us online, where else? www.koshertorah.com. Shabbat Tov, as we say, as well as in this special night, Chodesh Tov. It is now Rosh Chodesh Elul, the new month of the Hebrew month of Elul. We are one month away from Rosh Hashanah. So, tonight our topic is entitled Soul Origins. Where you come from, where you're at, where you're going. And fits very nicely into the time, as we say, Devar Ito Matov. Um, for those of you who have a little bit of experience with the Mazalot astrology, we know that this is the Hebrew month Elul. It is the Betula, the Virgo, the Virgin. But most people do not understand the Kabbalistic significance of what Virgo the Virgin is. It has nothing to do with a female character. It has nothing to do with a sexual issue or a lack of sexual issue a la Virgin. But what the symbol is, is Virgo represents the symbol of the Hiuli, the Hyle, the prima mater, the fifth element, the original source from which comes everything prior to there being a materialization and development into the four elements fire air water earth this is the basic foundation it was always considered that the female is like the unprinted essence and only when she bonds with the male does she take on the form which then materializes as children etc and so on which is then the symbolic progression of the development of the universe. So essentially in Kabbalah, for those of you who are familiar with the Zoharic and Lurianic schools, when we talk about the beginning, we speak that in the beginning, the first materialization of any kind of, if you will, movement in existence was the creation or the manifestation of what we call the halal, the empty space, where in which God's light could penetrate. This is overtly sexual. Where in which that empty space was the creation of the womb. Where in which the shefa, the kav of the Ein Sof comes in, very symbol symbolically of the phallus, very symbolically of the zera, the semen, that comes in and creates the world. So essentially the act of creation was a feminine act. So here we are before Rosh Hashanah, which again is Libra, balancing of the scales. Where do we go before the balancing of the scales or the Zechel Lema'ase Bereshit, the remembrance of creation? We go back to before creation. We go back to the time of the halal. We go back to the womb of the feminine, where in which everything is still in the prima matter state prior to its being developed into all the different forms into things. So a little astrological note there in relationship to the time. And as it says, the barbi ito matov, everything in its time is good. Let's talk about now souls. Bottom line, we have to know and understand that, remember like it says in Genesis 1.27, right? No, I have to quote the verses here. God created us in his image, male and female, he created them. Understand now from the beginning a very, very important point, okay? All souls are created by God, all right? All souls are part of a greater whole, which the Kabbalah refers to as the collective, if you will, super soul of Adam HaRishon, or primordial man. That's not Adam Kadmon, spoken of in Kabbalah. This is Adam Rishon. That's the guy from the Bible. Essentially, how the Kabbalists and the old prophetic traditions have always understood, this goes back literally long before Kabbalah, Kabbalah, I, I hold like the rationalist school, and I use the word Kabbalah to define the Provence and Spanish mis metaphysical mysticism that developed out of the Zohar traditions in those schools onward. But the original secrets of the Torah tradition, which is what we teach here at our kosher Torah school, very different. That's why in our school, we teach the prophetic traditions, the magical traditions, the meditative traditions, very different from the later academic schools, uh, which are the popular ones today. But with that being said, getting back to the point, all souls created by God 
part of the greater super soul of collective humanity. Now, this is actually a very important point because in later Judaism, something that developed, uh, I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but a myth, in my opinion, yeah, a myth has developed, which has become embraced today, very much so in certain schools of modern Kabbalah, Hasidicism, and certainly by the Haredim. And again, I emphasize the word myth, meaning it ain't true. And that myth is the existence of what some call a Jewish soul, as opposed to a non-Jewish soul. Sorry, folks, there's no such thing. Do you have a Jewish identity? But of course, if you are embracing or walking the Torah path or feel an affinity towards it, you can have a Jewish identity. In the words of psychology, Carl Jung referred to this as the racial subdivisions of the collective unconscious, where in which you just feel an affinity towards a culture. I'll give an example from my own experience, even though I am a practicing Orthodox Sephardic Kabbalist rabbi. Since my teen years, I've also equally been a student of Chinese martial arts. I've been a student of the Shaolin traditions, the Nan Tuan traditions, and later the soft styles of Wu Dan. I've studied different forms of Taiji, Bagua Chuan, and the rest. I regularly will learn and study uh, the Dao De Jing. Uh, I'm very fluent with Yi Jing and uh, all the, the writings of Lao Tzu, Shuang Tzu, and many of these things. I feel a natural affinity towards these things I have all my life. Now, some will say, oh, it's because in a previous life you might have been Chinese. Maybe I was. I don't know. I like Chinese food. What's that say? I, I think I could use chopsticks. No, 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 no understand that there's a difference here. Souls all emanate from a single collective source. But that collective source has within it multiple subdivisions. Jung in psychology referred to these divisions as racial subdivisions. Those definitely exist. There's no doubt about that. You can see people who have a predilection towards thinking in a certain way. Clearly, we see that with what people refer to as a Jewish soul. You clearly see this with a Catholic soul as opposed to an evangelical or Protestant soul. You will clearly see this in the Shia tradition or in the Sunni tradition. You'll see this in many different ways. In the Kabbalah, we refer to this as souls symbolically speaking, of course, emanating from different parts of the greater body. You can have souls that emanate from the head. You can have souls which emanate from the heart. You can have souls that emanate from the hand or from the ear or from the nose or from the eye or whatever. Now, we don't need to try to make correlations between different types of souls and sociological, political, cultural affiliations. I mean, that's kind of silly. And all such associations, needless to say, would be some uh, subjective interpretations in the eye of the beholder. So for example, again, I'll speak personally to make it and to make my point. We live in the Torah observant world today here, especially in the West, in a predominantly what's called Ashkenazi cultural tradition. That's the Eastern European tradition. I was never raised in that tradition. I do not feel comfortable in that tradition. It is foreign to me. I do not speak Yiddish. I don't mind wearing a black suit. All right. I wear a black suit. I'll wear it with a good old Jerry Garcia tie and really lighten it up. <laughs> Today was Shabbat and when we went to the Ashkenazi synagogue, I was wearing my traditional black suit. Yes, we can wear black again on Shabbat. Uh, long story about that for another time. I was wearing my Jerry Garcia tie. A lot of people complimented it. So uh, you see my, my picture, I, I think I have it on Facebook. It has one of the Garcia ties. They're really great. I love them. I think they're, they're, fa they're fabulous. I love the colors in them. But anyway, getting back to soul origins here. And this is actually the tie stuff is going to play into that. For me, I don't like Ashkenazi music. 
Oh, the oy, 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 oy stuff drives me nuts. But that's me. For other people, they love it. They embrace it. And that's great. Ashkenazi food. There is a law in this house, my house. Thou shalt not bring in gefilte fish. You bring a filter fish, it stays out on the porch. Never ate it, don't want to know it, don't touch it. Ech. But that's me. People are different. People might be offended by my saying that. <laughs> you should know, you know I don't care about offending people. That's never been one of my great fortes of being politically correct. In my cultural expression, I enjoy things that are Sephardic, what can I say? I enjoy things that are Moroccan because that is a culture which I have absorbed and feel comfortable with, whether it's in the different types of the foods or the culture. And yeah, I got a couple of jalabias hanging in my closet, not that I wear them in any real time. I'm more wearing my leather jacket when I'm riding my Harley than I'm wearing the jalabia and, and making believe that I'm some kind of a North African rabbi. I'm an American. And what does that mean? Remember, the topic here is soul origins. Well, my soul doesn't emanate from America any more than it would emanate from Morocco or Poland or anywhere else. And in all due respect for the public record, uh, I have Ashkenazi blood as, as Sephardi blood in that respect. So we're not Samechtet, as we say. We're not pure Sephardi. So Hatate, Awipi, Pashati, for those of you know what that means. Again, that's it, just a joke, so please. All right, but let's understand now. Cultural expressions, like I've been discussing here, do not identify your soul origin. What they may identify is your cultural orientations, which may or may not be a reflection of certain elements of your personality. And it's your personality which is going to define your soul origins so as in the uh, you know build up for this class when i asked the questions where are you from where are you now where are you going well i mean i was kidding with one of the guys in text and he was saying he's from this place and he's living here or whatever and i said no 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 we're talking about psychologically psychologically spiritually they are identical and when we talk about soul origins, meaning in the ultimate source in the greater body of Adam, well, we use the example, the symbolic image of the tree of life, the Etz Haim, the uh, Sephirotic pattern of the ten Sephirot, which for those of you who are with me on Facebook, you will see I posted that image of the ten Sephirot on my Facebook page. Uh, you go see it there. Or just type in Tensifero than any web search, Google search, or whatever. I'm sure the image will pop up. Uh, for those of you who are on YouTube watching this, you can do the same. If you're not familiar with the Tensifero, it's a very common pattern. But what that pattern helps us identify is not so much the metaphysical, you know, worlds in uh, the greater galaxy. It's defining for us the worlds within our reality as human beings. You see, this is one of the major issues with regards to understanding Kabbalah. The Zohar, for example, is never ever meant to be taken literally. And people who look into Zohar teachings literally are completely misunderstanding the Zohar. It is written in one of the commentaries that there is a new commentary written on the Zohar every single day. For those who are familiar with Zoharic commentaries, they differ radically from one another. It is not like commentaries on the Gemara or on Halakha, where in which you have, if you will, a general agreement or a consensus of opinion. Zoharic understandings can differ widely. When it comes to understanding the Torah of the Arizal, many people completely go off the wagon with this one where in which they interpret the teachings of the Luriana Kabbalah in some bizarre way, literally. And I remember when I learned years ago with my teacher, Rabbi Meir Levi, how he taught me how fundamentally wrong that was, and unfortunately how widespread that was. 
This is one of the great areas where I differ from many of my peers. Many of my peers, these are the guys who are out there teaching Kabbalah, you know, on the internet, out there. You got all the websites, writing all the popular books. And they'll talk to you about all the worlds and the Sifirot and the this and the that because they read all the books. Problem is they don't understand what they're reading. They're still thinking that these are worlds out there as opposed to worlds in here. Now, this is a very important point that's actually made by no, no one less than the Baal Shem Tov himself, and Sefer Baal Shem Tov, Parshat Vat Hanan. The story that's related there, that the Baal Shem Tov uh, once came across a man who was teaching Kabbalah publicly, and he told the guy, you shouldn't be publicly teaching, to which the guy turned to the Baal Shem Tov, hey, you teach publicly, why shouldn't I? He goes, because when I teach people, the Baal Shem Tov says, I'm teaching them about the inner worlds, now all these sephirot and stuff apply to us, I use the word psychologically, he says, whereas you're teaching them kekshuto, meaning how they, you think this is all external worlds. Essentially, he was telling the guy you're doing more harm than good. So for those of you who want to study Kabbalah out there, please understand that if you're thinking that you're learning about, you know, the world somewhere out there on the other side of the rainbow, your teacher is not teaching you correctly. All Kabbalah is psychology. And when you understand the Kit Vehari psychologically, then you got the system correctly. And then you'll be able to understand and use it correctly as a tool of power to cultivate and develop psychic abilities, which is really what it's all about, cultivating, expanding the powers of the mind. And you'll find that that is a universal message across all different cultures in practicing meditative traditions. We transcend such mythologies of divisions and dualities, where in which you have kadosh and non-kadosh and all the rest. You recognize as you transcend these things, God's glory is full of the earth. There's nothing other than the one reality. You transcend such limitations. But that's getting to a high level. How do we get there? This is what we follow, the pattern of the ten sifirot. The pattern of the ten sifirot is our, if you will, guide to ascent and, for that matter, descent. Essentially speaking, again, if you can visualize the image of the sifirot, we stand at the bottom at Malchut. Symbolically speaking, God's all the way at the top at Keter. And our job is to go from Malchut to Keter. God's going to drag us up. One way or another, we're going to get to the top. Now, we have a choice. We can go to the top through the center column, or we can go up through the right side, or we can go up through the left side. We choose. Now, this is all symbolic talk, okay? What that means is this, as we all very well know. In our lives, we have blessing and a curse. We talk about this in the Pshat Mikra, in the Chumash in the Torah itself, where God tells us, I put before you a blessing and a curse. Essentially, we're all going to get to where we need to go. How we get there, how long it takes us to get there, what path we end up taking, that's our choice. So up until now, everything has been, if you will, moralistic in my expression. But now, if we want to understand personality, in the Lurianic tradition, we refer to what we understand today as personality as, again, the Lurian tradition would call it levels of soul. And we have five levels of soul, names of the soul, nefesh, the ruach, the neshama, the haya, and the yehida. Pretty much what these levels of soul are, are levels of consciousness and at the same time, personality orientations. So when we want to ask what's our soul origin, we can say you are a nefesh soul, a ruach soul, a neshama soul, a haya soul, or a yechida soul. That's one way to put it. But the souls themselves correlate to what the different planes or worlds in the Kabbalistic tradition, which again we refer to from lower to higher, asiya, the in the world of making corresponding to the physical world, physical consciousness, asiatic consciousness, yetzirah, 
which is the world of the astral. I call it the astral, some call it whatever. Uh, that's the emotional realm. That's the Ruach level of soul or the emotional orientation soul. Neshama, world of Biri'ah, that also corresponds uh, to the intellect, maybe intellectually oriented soul, corresponds to the sphere of the Bina. Chaya, fourth level of soul, corresponds to the sphere of Hochma, which is the intuitive soul, the psychic soul, the spiritually minded soul. And the Yechida, we don't have the Yechida souls here. They are the high and sublime. Those are the ones we might today call, uh, we, we, we might call them tzaddikim or kodashim. In the Eastern traditions, they refer to them as avatars, those who come down here for no other reason for themselves. The one who we know of this in our Torah tradition, of course, is Mashiach, the Mashiach to come, and he ain't here yet. You could say, yeah, he's born in every generation. Of course, that's Midrashic. And every now and then you're going to hear legends and stories on the internet uh, that the Mashiach was born and he's living in Jerusalem or this one and that one. Of course, one of the biggest mythologies today is the story that uh, my old teacher, Rabbi Yitzhak Kuduri, uh, before he passed away, wrote a note that was supposedly opened after his death saying that Yeshu or Yehoshua was the name of Mashiach. Well, that made a big hullabaloo. It's a big thing that's still thrown around today in evangelical Christian circles. But of course, for those of us who know the family, know and recognize that that story just never happened. It's, it's, it's a complete fabrication. And that's what his family says, because they were there. I mean, in all due respect, Rob Kadori, as great a holy man as he was, was always in a different consciousness, if you will. I, I know the man. I know Talking to him, he was like, he was like not there. But anyway, prior to his death, and he was old. I mean, he had this tube down his throat. He wasn't talking to anybody. So all these stories were a bunch of, you know, silly nonsense. Let's dispel them. But let's go back now to soul origins. Every soul has a, let's refer to it psychologically, personality orientation. An Asiatic soul that emanates from the Asiatic realm is pretty much a simple everyday type of person. We call it the meat and potatoes type of personality. Person's interested in getting along, doing things. It's not a very emotionally deep person. It's not a very intellectually stimulating person. It's a simple person who lives a simple life, which might honestly describe the vast majority of people in the world. The Arizal teaches that the majority of the people in this world are a nefesh level of soul. They are this Asiatic level of consciousness. Got to get all of our metaphors correlated here. For those of you who need help grasping the Kabbalistic metaphors, my ebook, Basic Kabbalistic Concepts and Terminologies, is readily available. It's only six bucks. Go click a button. I have a link to it in Facebook. You go to my, my Kosher Torah school, uh, purchase it and download it there. I try to make things following the KISS rule. Keep it short and simple. Well, that's the way I like to do things. If I can't make it short and simple, you know, something, or you can take a point here and you can expand it like that, make it, you know, wide open, or you can take what's wide open and bring it down to a point, make it things simple. I like simple stuff. What can I say? Maybe I'm going to have an Asiatic orientation to myself. But what do you know? A uh, Yitzhiratic soul, which we call a Ruach, is the emotional soul. That's one who is very, very artistic. Usually musicians, poets, people like Vincent van Gogh and like, like that. They are just so emotional, corresponding to the six Sephiroth. They're all over the place, back and forth, everything. This is where a lot of the bipolar people correspond to as well. An emotional soul, a Yetzirahic soul. That's the level called Ruach. Then you have what we call the Beriatic soul, corresponding to... The neshama level. This is the intellectual soul. These are like your college professors, your your people, your intellectuals, and the like. All they do is they think, 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 because that's what they are. They're the thinkers. So what do you think happens when you get a bariatic thinker and a yetziratic feeler together? <laughs> Speaking two different languages psychologically, it's very hard to make a bridge between them. Now, obviously, we all have parts of this. In ourselves we're all composites in that respect remember like I spoke right at the beginning 
about the prima matter, symbolically the Virgo, and it develops into the elements. These corresponding elements, fire, air, water, earth, correspond to these levels of soul and these levels of personality. So fourth level of soul, well, we'll go back to correlations. Fourth level of soul, we call it the Atsilutic soul, the uh, Haya level of soul. This personality is what I call the psychic, the intuitive, the spiritual soul. These are those people who are just out of this world. Now, Jung speaks very, very emphatically about the importance of the level of spirit. We call it the spiritual. He stated very clearly, whereas the intellect cannot rise to the level of the spirit and should never do. In other words, there are very different levels. This is even understood in psychology. We know what it means to be intuitive, psychic. And I'm not just talking about psychic development powers like in a Jedi or something like that. Yes, we've had Kabbalists and other people in other meditative traditions who do develop these types of mental skills. There's no such real thing as being from a dark side or a light side. It's all from God. You want proof? I'll give you proof. How about the book of Numbers? You remember there's only one other prophet in the entire Torah, five books of Moses, whose prophecy is included right next to Moses. You know who that is? Bilam. Balaam. Remember the guy with the donkey? Right. His prophecies are right there. Now, in our Torah tradition, it is taught that he was the dark side of Moses, that he was the ultimate bad guy, like Moses was the ultimate good guy. Now, go look this up if you want. There is historical evidence to validate the historicity of Bil'am. They've actually found that in modern-day Jordan. So it did exist. We all believe that Moses existed too. Moses on one side, Bil'am on the other side, but God was able to speak to both. Because even though Bil'am was your classical dark lord of the Sith, if you will, all right, God still was able to channel through him because he had his mental faculties developed. What people do with those mental faculties, that's their choice. That's the difference between good and evil. But the development thereof is pure psychology. Think about it like this. I can go to the gym, build up big muscles. What do I do with those muscles? Well, I can use them to help or I can use them to harm. It's the same thing with psychic powers. The development is across the board the same. Whether you're studying the Pantanjali Sutras, or you're studying Buddhist traditions, shamanistic traditions, it's what you do with them that makes the difference. So understand and recognize that. God's reality fills the universe. How people choose to embrace it and what they choose to do with it, that's their choice. We walk a path which focuses on the here and the now. We call that the halakha. So when it comes to soul orientations, whether you're talking about the high and sublime intuitive soul of the atsilutic consciousness, the bariatic soul, which is the intellectual consciousness, the yetziratic soul, which is the emotional consciousness, or the simple asiatic soul, which is the basic down-to-earth consciousness. Bottom line, all of us have to live in the here and now. All of us have to live in this world. All of us are composites of all of these elements combined. No Asiatic soul is exclusive to that. Everyone has within it a Yitzhiratic, Bariatic, and Atsilutic level. Every personality, obviously, has an emotional component, an intellectual component, and a spiritual component. Some are more developed than others. And that's the reality of personality. Our job and mission on earth is to discover who we truly are. When you would have gone the olden days to Rav Sharabi, Rav Shalom, he could look at you and he would gaze into your essence and would ask you a very simple question. Who are you? You don't be stupid and answer with the name. The name of your physical body is not your true name. It is not your true essence. Your name of your soul, which is your true essence, 
is of a language not of this earth. It's not Hebrew, it's not Aramaic. There is a segula, a tradition, where in which we are taught that when a soul passes out of the body, dies, it is met on the other side by malachim. And the first question they ask you is your name. And many people say, well, gee, I forgot my name. And then the angels beat the snot out of you. All right, they beat the soul out of you. We call that chibuta kever. So many people think, ah, oh, the way I'm going to remember my name is I'm going to recite a verse from the Psalms of the Bible, which has the first letter of my name and ends with the last letter of my name. That's going to help me remember my name. Well, that's all well and nice. It's a nice little story, but it ain't going to work. Why? Because they're not going to be asking you the name of the body that died is in the grave. They don't care if your name was Reuben, Shimon, or Levi. They're asking you, what's the name of your soul? What's your true eternal name? It's not Hebrew, it's not Aramaic, it's not English, French, Spanish, or anything else. It's who you really are. You don't know that now, do you? No, you don't. But when we practice meditation, this is exactly what the Ari teaches. We have to remember our name. And the only way that that can ever be accomplished for real is by self-introspection, practicing the Merkava tradition, and recognizing that the man on the throne is a reflection of our own image. And only by embracing these traditions, practicing them, can we expand consciousness to become aware of who we truly are. And in that process, you will recognize just how much of you, what percentage, whatever, is Asiatic, what percentage is Yitziratic, what percentage is Baryatic, which percentage is Atsiludic? Or how physically oriented you are emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. Everybody's different. You have to find your own identity. Now, this is not some hard thing. What is the teaching about the Malachim beating you in the grave? They're trying to disconnect you from association with your identity in this world, association with the physical body and that life which is past, to try to reorient you to your greater universal self. So let me share with you within a context. Just before I began this class, I was having uh, some texting, chatting with one of our students. Uh, for those of you who know part and parcel being a registered student with our kosher Torah schools, I give you access. I mean, I sit, I'll talk with you, I'll chat with you, and you know, we have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. That's why I like to talk with my students, because we have a personal bond. So we were chatting, and the student, like everybody else in the world, is, you know, griping, oh, this is going on in life, and that going on in life. I don't want to come back in the next life, or whatever, whatever. And... I was commenting and I was saying, you know, some of that's not our choice. Ours is not the question why ours is about to do and die, like Lord Tennyson said. And remember, Battle of the Light Brigade kind of stuff? Well, what that actually means is this. Let's be blunt. Earth is kind of like a prison planet. There is a psychic envelope around the planet at the level of the moon, and all souls are congealed in it. And the watchers are out there, and they don't allow any soul to go beyond that realm and domain other than those who calibrate consciousness that enables them to go beyond. That is what we call ascent. This is what we teach in the Merkava school. In the earlier traditions of the Hechalot, the palaces, this was called the names of the angels and going through the different palaces. It's not like you learn a different name. You go off into a meditation. There's a big angel there with a fiery sword. You say, let me pass in the name of so-and-so, and he moves aside for you. Try that sometime. You'll get that sword where the sun don't shine, if you know what I mean. All in a symbolic meditation, of course. But when you calibrate your consciousness and you evolve spiritually, psychically, and you go to that level and you are confronted by the power of mind, your calibration of your personality in your life projects before you an energy which is recognized. That proclaims you as you go. You are recognized, and the doors will naturally open for you, and consciousness can pass and ascend. So only those people who are at that level are going to get beyond that, because otherwise you're going to 
get to a level and you're going to be bounced back. You'll be recycled. That's called reincarnation, Gilgul Hanashimot. And that's why we come back over and over and over again until we get it right. That's really what it's all about. And I know a lot of people don't like that, but it explains the truth of our reality. And what I've just described to you very much is a Kabbalistic teaching, but it's also the teaching in many of the other traditions around the world. We all know the same truth. There are these watchers, these guardians, where they're called Irin Wakadosh, all right? The eyes that are holy, they see, they watch. This is their job. This is what they do. When we go through the cycles of astrological influence and everything else, all we're trying to do is calibrate our souls. How we do this in the few minutes we have left is what I'll discuss. I discussed some of this in our past class on meditation. I write all about this in my book, Walking in the Fire. Get the book. Learn for yourselves. I talk about this in my classes, in the Shadi Kiddusha classes, where I talked about spiritual ascent and the like. Get the courses. Learn these things for yourselves. Become one of my students. Register with our school. Be my friend. Talk to me. All right? Our, the, the monthly financial donation is, is, is at a threshold everybody can support. And in that respect, we can work together and do what we need to do. We work with the name of Hashem, Yud Ke Vav Ke, following the traditions that is taught in Shah Ruach HaKodesh Ari. I teach you how you visualize each and every letter of the name, Yud, He, and Vav, and He. The Yud, that corresponds to that level of Atsilut or Atsilutic consciousness. The first He corresponds to Biryatic consciousness, that's the intellect. The Yud, of course, is intuitive psychic consciousness. The Vav corresponds to Yitziratic consciousness, your emotions and stuff. And the final He to the physical, physical consciousness, that's Asiatic consciousness. So how you see each and every letter is a psychological projection of where your soul is at, at each and every level of the intuitive, the intellectual, the emotional, the physical. And a good Kabbalist who's trained in these things, like the Baal Shem Tov taught, will work with you. In the Merkava path, one-on-one, -on -one, like the Gemara says, Halakha says, one-on-one, -on -one, no other way. And I say to you, what do you see in the Yod? And you'll describe to me this, and I'm able to understand through my training and experience where you're at with regards to that level of consciousness within you. And I'll give instructions, guidance, etc. And you work with, that's what we call tikkun, rectifying that level. Same thing with the hay, the vav, and the hay. Soul origins. Where you come from, the greater body of Adam. We all have parts within us. We all have a place to go. We all have a mission, a purpose, and a destiny. In Jungian psychology, we say that there's this teleological direction to psychological individuation. You've heard me talk about that before. But it means that there's something guiding us, our higher selves, towards an already predetermined purpose and plan in our lives. Everything in our lives is guiding us towards something. There are those of you who are my friends, my students, who you know I give a damn about you. We've gone through hell in our lives. We all know it. And you turn to me because you think I have answers and you ask, what the heck is going on? And I can only give you a real simple answer. Don't ask me, ask yourself. Meaning, everything happens for a purpose. Everything happens for a reason. Like Gohel, time and a purpose for all things under heaven. We use the name of God as a psychic, psychological tool to reflect back to us our reality. We have other names, chants, sounds that we use that help open up levels of consciousness to make us more sensitive to and aware of what's going on inside ourselves so that we can ultimately recognize who we really are. And you might come to a revelation and insight of what your real name is. And, well, not, it's not going to be in any earthly language, but you will know it intuitively. But let's say even that that comes to you. Then you have to ask, what does it really mean? What does it all mean? When the great Mikubal would ask you, who are you? How do you answer? Well, you can be snippy about it and say, well, I am me. But what is me? 
what are you? Who are you? Where do you fit into the greater body of Adam, in which we are all connected, all of us? That is the great reality. Some of us are head souls, some of us are arm souls, some of us are heart, some of us are, you know, rectum souls. Every part of the body has its important vital function. You need to find yours. We use the name Yudke Vavke as our directive, as our tool to properly calibrate us in the realms of personality and orientation. And this will help us recognize our true place in life, where we need to be, what we need to do. In my path, when I work with different students, we naturally will attract a certain element of student, which is why our kosher Torah school pretty much, in all honesty, it's not really for everybody. It's open to everybody, but it's not for everybody. You have much more popular systems out there, which are more common denominator systems. Well, we're not a common denominator school. Again, everybody's always welcome. I don't care who and what you are. You want to come and learn by all means. But that doesn't mean that what we have to offer is your, as they say, cup of tea. But if it is, you'll know it. And if it is, you'll drink it. And if it is, you'll be part of our greater family. And that is what this kosher tour school is all about and why I am here to teach you. This, these classes in the public domain here, Facebook, YouTube, it's all an outreach attempt to reach those like-minded souls who want to come and practice our Aliyah Ascent School of Kabbalah Meditation, the original schools of the secrets of the Torah, the Masi Merkava. We are here for you. If you feel that this is your home with us, Welcome. Join us. On that note, find your soul. Find your origins. Know who you are. Use the tools that we have available for you. Discover yourself. You will discover then your purpose. And you will see within it all the reality of the existence of God. Take that to heart. I'm your host, Dario Bartzado from the Kosher Torah School. Thank you all for joining me in this class. God be willing. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next. Kol Tuv. Shalom.